Sacred Stones is my favorite Fire Emblem game, and like any Fire Emblem game, it's got lots of maps. And I want to talk about them, so I'm going to rank all the maps based on how fun I think they are. I'll quickly go over what I like in a map, though if you want more detail on that, I'll link my video on what makes a good map to me in the description. Basically, I like when there's reward for taking risks, good clarity as to what the objectives and challenges on a map are, and if the map ties in well with the story, that's a great bonus. I'm going to be brief on Ephraim route maps, which I'm going to cover at the end, compared to Erica route maps, because I don't play Ephraim route that often, but I will touch on them. Before we dive into the maps, I want to quickly thank my patrons, Danny Doyle, Helix, and Acrobatic Jazz. Your support is really appreciated. If you also want to support the channel and get early access to videos, consider joining the Patreon linked in the description. Now we can properly dive into ranking the maps. To start with, we have a few maps that are kind of tricky to rank. The Prologue Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 are all incredibly quick and easy maps that either Seth rolls right through, or if you want to use them to feed kills to Erika or Franz, you can do that too. These are essentially tutorials. Now, I do think these are actually bad maps. Other games have managed to do tutorial maps that are more interesting. FE6's Chapter 1 and even Fire Emblem 1's Chapter 1 jump to mind here. So I think it's unfortunate that FE8's early game maps are really straightforward and offer little to think about. However, they're also incredibly quick, which makes them bother me a lot less than other bad maps that take a long time to complete. So they get their own tier of Quick Seth Solo. Not great, but at least they're fast. Chapter 3 is the first chapter that's a little more interesting. There are at least chests for you to go grab and a recruitment for you to go do, although unfortunately the chests are really only enticing on your first playthrough since there's nothing of value in them, so they're really easy to skip on subsequent playthroughs. Still, figuring out the sequencing of breaking the walls here so that Seth can spend time killing enemies instead of killing walls is a fun little quirk when trying to play the map fast, and when you play it slow, there's not too much interesting going on here, as even if you want the chests, you have all the time in the world to get them. So the map plays out very much like the last three when played at a slower pace, which is to say, kind of boring. So it has to go, unfortunately, into the not fun tier of maps. After this map, we have Chapter 4, and this is a map I have a bit of a soft spot for. It's basically a training map. We have a bunch of low-level units and a bunch of weak monsters to train them on. So it's a great map to pick your favorite project unit and pump a bunch of EXP into them. It's not a particularly challenging map, but I enjoy the resource management aspect of how you choose to use all the experience. And another cool thing about this map is that when you play it quickly, it's one of the first maps where Seth doesn't just do everything, because the enemies are so spread out, so a fast clear for this map involves Vanessa, Garcia, Franz, Seth, and Arthur all getting in on the action. And you even have time to feed a killer two to Ross if you want to do that. And so this is the first map to go into our fine tier. It's not, like, super fun, but I enjoy deciding where I want the EXP to go in more casual playthroughs, and figuring out the two-turn clear for this map was really fun in my first faster playthrough. Is it amazing? No. But I think this map is solidly fine. Next up is Chapter 5, and this is the first map I really like. And it might seem like it took a while for us to get to a map I really like, but you should be aware that finishing the first four maps takes about 20 minutes total, so... We don't have to wait too long to get to one I like. This map is perhaps most memorable for the Joshua recruitment, which is one of the more interesting challenges up to this point in the game. I've seen many a blind playthrough reset either to Joshua killing someone with a crit or someone killing Joshua. But what I like about this recruitment is that there are good ways to recruit him safely and more than one. You can bait the enemies around him and then walk Natasha up to go recruit him, or you could have Seth fight him unequipped or with a steel sword. This lets you safely recruit him as early as turn two. So it's a neat challenge with multiple approaches that can lead you to success. And that's just one part of the map. This map also boasts a few villages for you to visit and bandits that will destroy them. So it's the first map that really rewards you for either taking risks or coming up with plans that allow you to move quickly because you want to get to those villages before they get destroyed. And if you take too long doing the Joshua recruitment, then the northernmost villages might be in a little bit of trouble. The bandits don't arrive until turn 6 and 8 though that attack the north village, so there's not an overwhelming pressure on a new player to go fast. The city walls that can be flown over also encourages you to take advantage of Vanessa's flight to go grab those villages. To me, this is the gold standard for FE8 early game maps. The Joshua recruitment is fun to figure out, and you're rewarded for figuring out a fast, safe way to do it, while not being punished too harshly for failing to do so, since the consequence for going too slow is just losing a torch in a guiding ring. Nothing too backbreaking for a new player. 
It's a great way to ease players in before more difficult challenges start to appear later in the game. Additionally, I like that this map is split up into three different sections at the beginning. It makes it so that there are places you can send your weaker units to in order to gain some experience without being overwhelmed by multiple enemies, and without getting in Seth's way as he deals with the more difficult part of the map. It's a good map and our first entry in the fun map tier. Unfortunately, it is followed by a map I don't love, which is our first and only guide in chapter. In Chapter 5X, we take a break from Erica's army and join up with Ephraim, our Christmas calves, and Orson, aka Seth 2, but only for one chapter. This map is essentially a training arc for whichever of the calves you decide to use, or for Ephraim. As a Kyle enjoyer, I like this aspect of the map, but it's worth noting that if you're doing Erica route and you prefer Franz over Kyle or Ford, this can feel like a very nothing map, because you give a bunch of EXP to three units you don't care about. However, even if you are a based Kyle lover like me, this is still a boring map. It's basically just a hallway. There are two chests at the beginning, and there's not really any challenge to getting them as you start right next to them. So basically this map is either Orson runs down the hall and kills everything, or Orson runs down the hall while carrying someone so that he doesn't double, and then Kyle, Ford, or Ephraim kill everything instead. Unlike Chapter 4, which is also a training arc map, this one is boring. There's nothing to really think about, it's just run down hallway and kill enemies, and it's fairly long for what it is. If you're playing Erica route, the decision of who to give the kills to isn't even that significant, because you're basically just choosing which support paladin you want. In Ephraim route, it's a little more interesting since giving Ephraim EXP becomes a more attractive option, but regardless, none of that makes this map super engaging. So it goes in the frowny face tier because that is how I feel when I play this map. I also want to clarify that it is not a problem for a map to be easy, it just can't be boring. There will be some easy maps that rank well on this list, they just won't be hallways. Next up we have our first Fog of War map in Chapter 6. And one thing I like about this map is the big spider that's slowly making its way towards the villagers to eat them. It feels like a super maniacal thing for the bad guy to do, and it provides a nice sense of urgency for you to get through the map quickly. A lot of people struggle with this map on their first go-around, but I think it's more fair than it initially appears. Taking advantage of torches to see threats before they surprise you is important here, though it is possible you'll still be surprised by the cavaliers on the top side of the map. I like that the threat of the spider encourages you to get moving into the fog, but like Chapter 5, it's not so fast that the pressure feels unbearable. And it's not the end of the world to miss the reward. Again, a great way to ease a new player into time-based objectives without punishing them too hard if they fail to achieve it, since all you really miss out on is an Orion's Bolt. I don't think this map is as fun to play as Chapter 5 though, it's pretty much just a walk to the boss with your best units while the other units fight the enemies to the southeast, and most of the map is just open versus the three lanes in Chapter 5 that encourages you to split up and makes it easy to feed kills to your project units. There is a village on this map, but all it has is an antitoxin, so it's not that exciting. I don't love Fog of War maps, but as far as they go, this one's not too bad, so I'm gonna put it at the bottom of fine. After our Fog map, we have Chapter 7, which is Waterside Renval. And there are basically two ways to play this map. Either you go around the mountain and towards the boss, or you go over the river at the beginning and towards the boss. It's a fairly straightforward map, but there's a few things I like about it. One, I like that going over the river is an option. It's a great reward for learning how to rescue drop, and it shows you how great flyers are. And even if it's not a super big deal, it makes people feel rewarded if they leveled up Ross enough to get him into pirate, so that's nice too. I also like that there's a subtle side objective here in the form of an energy ring being held by a mage in the middle of the map. The energy ring has to be stolen and is lost if you kill the mage, so this actually prevents you from Seth sweeping with a javelin in the middle of the map, at least for one turn. You're gonna have to bait the mage with someone that can't kill him, or use Seth with a one range weapon instead of a javelin. And then you have to position Colm such that he'll be able to make the steal safely. It's a fun little side objective. One thing I don't like about this map is the ballista in the top right. It basically only threatens you as you come around the bend of the mountain, where there are several enemies. This makes that part of the map a little scary for your squishy units, which encourages you to just stomp that part of the map with Seth, since he can basically fight everything without a worry. All in all, it's an okay map, but I can't say it's that fun. Stealing the ring is a cool thing that you get to do, but other than that, it's just a straight shot to the boss or a long trek around the mountain. There just aren't a ton of interesting decision points here, so I'm putting it at the top of not fun. So it's not that bad, but I don't have fun when I play it. Chapter 8 is the first map where we have access to both Ephraim and Erica, though they start on opposite sides of the map. And I like this one. There's two ways to play this one as well. 
If you play it fast, it's sort of like playing two maps at once. Erica wants to blitz through the right side of the map onto the boss and grab the chests, while Ephraim wants to survive the left side of the map and get experience onto whatever unit you trained in 5x. This is particularly important if you chose to train Kyle or Ford, because you'll want to promote them in Chapter 9. I enjoy both sides of the map, and trying to grab the chests in a timely manner is pretty fun. Alternatively, instead of keeping your armies separate, you can send some or all of Erika's army to the southwest to help Ephraim out, and sweep through the map with your death ball of soldiers. This map tries to make you think there's a time pressure on getting the chests by including an enemy thief, but there's really no rush and that's for two reasons. First, that thief doesn't actually spawn on a certain turn, instead he spawns when you enter the area outside the throne room. So you can take the map slow and that thief won't spawn until you're near the chests anyway. Second, and I suspect this part was unintentional, that thief actually never opens a chest. He'll just come hit you. So you don't have to worry about losing the items in the chests, you have all the time in the world to go get them. I think this one is both fun to play fast and fun to play slow. It's a great merging of the armies for the first time, and I will say this doesn't affect my ranking of the map, but I can't talk about this map without mentioning that I hate that Ephraim escapes himself instead of being rescued by Erica. That would have been cooler. Still a fun map though, it goes in the fun tier. Now we're going to go through the Erica route maps, aka the best route, and we kick off with my favorite map in the route, Distant Blade. Remember earlier when I said the side objectives in chapters 5 and 6 ease you in and prepare you for the more demanding side objectives later? Well, here are the more demanding side objectives. Distant Blade has three tasks for you to complete besides the main objective. It has two villages for you to grab and a unit to recruit. The unit's pretty easy to recruit, but the villages are sort of tricky. Pirates are all over the place and you need to move pretty fast to get to the village on the left and take advantage of your flyers to get to the village on the bottom. Figuring out how to get to all of the villages on your first playthrough is pretty tricky. If you want to have a flyer grab the bottom village, you have to do some somewhat specific movements to get it and avoid the pirates. The village on the left you're going to want to send either Seth or a promoted cavalier to go get, but the neat thing about this village is that since Seth doesn't have time to grab the village and kill all the enemies at the beginning of the map, you're kind of forced to use more of your combat units. It's a great chance for units like Joshua to shine. I also really like the sniper this map places near the beginning. Seth can't kill him with a javelin, and he doesn't have time to stop on his way to the village. So dealing with this high stat enemy with your non-Seth units is an interesting challenge. And since it's a sniper, you always have options like boxing him in if your units are really struggling. Lastly, this is a great map for the Cavalier you hopefully just promoted. I love doing things like promoting Kyle and rescue dropping him to the bottom of the map to grab the village and fight all the enemies down there. All in all, it's just a really fun map and I think it's really fun figuring out how to get all the side objectives the first time. I think if I were remaking it, I would probably make it a kill boss map instead of route as I think the villages provide enough incentive not to boss skip, but it's a small quibble. This map is a windmill slam dunk for me, and it goes right into our peak tier. After Distant Blade, we have another strong Erica route map in Revolt at Carcino. This map is really big at first glance, but you're really only going to use the top half of it. But I like the bottom half being there anyway, because it lets you see what's coming for you. You get a good idea of how long you have before some of those units down there get to you, compared to if the map was smaller and the units down there spawned as reinforcements instead. It's good clarity. The main side objective for this map is the three green units that start below you, as well as Marissa, the one recruitable red unit. And there's a few ways you can approach this map. You can send Tana to go recruit the green units, and she can do it pretty well by flying over the mountains, but you need to be careful as there's an enemy ballista below the green units, so you need to either send a friend with her, or hope the green units kill the archer quickly so that Tana can move in. If you don't want to worry about flyer effectiveness, you can also send Erica down to do this recruitment. But this is a significant detour for her and will probably lead you to having to fight a bunch of flying reinforcements because you won't be able to finish the map before they spawn. There is one more option for recruiting the green units, which is just finishing the map before they die. Which is very possible, but comes with the consequence of not being able to recruit Marissa because she's a red unit and you need to recruit Garrick so he can recruit her. So right off the bat, there's a few approaches that one can reasonably take to the map, and they will change depending on how you decide to approach the main objective. Do you blitz the boss and say you're okay with missing Marissa, or do you send Tana and a buddy to go get the green units and take your time a bit more? If you are recruiting Marissa, there's a sleep staff that complicates this as well. You need to send one of your staffers so that the sleeper doesn't put Garrick to sleep and stop him from recruiting Marissa. 
I also like the reinforcements on this map. They encourage you to get moving, but if you play slow and fight them, you can set up your army to do so reliably. I always have a good time with this map regardless of how I play it, so it goes right at the top of the very fun tier for me. After two great Erika maps, it is time for the mediocre ones. Creeping Darkness is a Fog of War route map filled with mostly wimpy skeletons. It's a great time to try to train up some project units, and that was okay in Chapter 4, but at this point I'm kinda moving on from my project units and just using good units. To the map's credit, the right side of it can be interesting. That's where we start to see some dangerous enemies like Gargoyles and Moth Dugs. This is one of the first chapters where Seth can fail to dominate. He will rarely double the Moth Dugs, though he may be able to one-shot them with a strong weapon. And if he got unlucky on speed levels, he may also fail to double the Death Goyle or Gargoyles. I sort of like this aspect of the chapter, because it's when you really need to start thinking about what you're going to do with that speed wing you got back in Chapter 9 if you haven't used it already. If your Seth hit his speed levels, you can give that wing to someone else. If he doesn't, he's a great candidate for it. So that's something that's fun to think about when you get to this map. However, this doesn't make the map actually fun to play. There's really just a couple dangerous pockets of the map while your units will pretty easily decimate the rest. There's a side objective in the form of the recruitable green units, but it's pretty rare for them to be in danger of dying, so there's not too much pressure here. One thing I will say is that this map comes right after a couple tricky maps, so it can be a nice breather or victory lap after dealing with those, and I do like that it gives a chance for a unit like Artur to shine because he gets to kill the tricky monsters with Slayer if you promoted him to Bishop. Still, for me the map goes at the top of not fun. There's a few interesting long-term decisions to make here, like whether to promote Garrick or how to use your stat boosters, but they don't make the map more fun to play. One note I'll make though, I don't mind the Fog of War on this map. I actually think it makes it a little more interesting. The problem is just that it's a route map full of mostly wimpy enemies. Speaking of boring route maps, Chapter 12 of Erika is Village of Silence, and it's my least favorite map in the game. It is a giant route map full of one-tile choke points. I don't want to harp on it too much because I did a whole video focused on this map that I'll link in the description, but here are the cliff notes. Played slow, there is almost zero chance of failure on this map. Enemies can be pulled one or two at a time, reinforcements are zone based so you can control when they spawn, and one tile choke points ensure that you never get dogpiled. So there's really no tension on this map, it's just a slow slog to the end of the map. And it's not that interesting if you play it fast either, because these spiders have to slowly move down off the mountain and you could send a spider or flyer up there, but the hit rates are going to be rough on that mountain terrain. No matter how you play this map, it's either frustrating or boring. And this is the one map that makes me consider going Ephraim route every time I play Sacred Stones. Instant frowny face tier map for me. After a couple maps I don't love, Erica gives us another good one in the form of Hamel Canyon. This map claims to be a survive map, but really it's a kill boss map in disguise as it ends when you kill the boss and I think that surviving is actually harder than killing the boss in many cases. However, with two win conditions comes two ways to play the map. You can back off from the ballistas and enemies at the beginning, but you may have a hard time on turn 9 when a new boss shows up on the left with a bunch of soldiers. And the boss has a mean bolting tome, so if you haven't cleared the ballistas it becomes hard to find a place for a unit to stand where they're safe. For that reason, I prefer to kill the ballistas and push through the middle of the map to the boss. But this can be tricky too, as the boss is defended by three rangers, and these rangers have hands. They're fast enough that only your fastest units can double them, and your middling speed units are actually at risk of being doubled. It's difficult to one-round them, and they pack a punch. The boss also has a ton of bulk, so it's hard to do something like sneak one unit by and have them kill the boss. You're gonna have to deal with the rangers. Sometimes this map gets criticized for making you wait a few turns to recruit Gormag because he spawns on turn 5. But I suspect this won't be too much of an issue for players unless they've really optimized this map. Turn 5 is not that late. Overall, I like this map. I like that the reinforcements showing up forces you to go aggressive and fight either the ballistas on the right or the bolting boss on the left to stop yourself from getting overwhelmed. Both ways of playing the map are fun and pretty challenging. It's going in the very fun tier for me. The last map before the merging of the armies for Erika route is Queen of White Dunes, and I enjoy this map for roughly the first half of it. Rushing down the halls to grab Renak is fun, and I enjoy taking care that I can kill the priest at the top without getting berserked. However, when you hit the throne room, things start to really slow down. The boss, Carlisle, is super dodgy, but not super dangerous. You will have a unit that can kill him, but it might take a while. Additionally, I've seen this map praised for its side objectives, but I want to push back on that a little bit. 
Side objectives only positively impact a map if getting the side objectives is interesting. In this case, I don't think they are. There are a ton of chests, but mostly in isolated rooms that are easy to clear, and there's no pressure to split up if you don't care about turns, so getting the side objectives here isn't interesting to me since you can just ferry around your strongest combat unit to go kill the enemies and grab the chests. There's not much to it. Playing faster, the side objectives are a bit more fun. You have to decide which chests to prioritize. For example, you really want to make time to grab that dragon spear to fight Valter in the next chapter, so you have to split some of your army off from your main force to go get it. But when you aren't putting time pressure on yourself, there's really no danger or difficult decision to make here. I don't like it much. It goes in the not fun tier for me. Next up, we have a rare desert map that I actually like. This map is a little different on each route, but not different enough that it changes my ranking. In Ephraim route, your army starts in the bottom left, while Erika and Inez and Saleh start in the north. And you need to send some units up to help or rescue them, because they're pretty squishy. In Erika route, your army starts to the north, and Ephraim, Dussel, and Noel arrive after a couple turns to the southwest. Those units are a bit more durable though, so there's not as much urgency to rescue them. I like both versions of this map. A cool thing about it is that the desert largely exists in the middle of the map, so it's mostly there to make it more difficult for you to merge your armies. Units that are typically bad on desert maps, like horses or foot soldiers, can have success on these maps because a lot of combat takes place to the north and south, where their movement is not impeded. So I like that the player is disincentivized from merging their armies immediately by the desert, but they aren't prevented from doing so. A player that wants to move units around can do so with strategic use of flyer rescues or by deploying units like Loot and Saleh, who can move full speed in the desert. I also like that the map features two pretty tricky bosses. Kalak and Valter are both fast, but can be beaten without too much trouble with proper planning. Garrick can take on Kalak if he hits his speed levels, or if you're worried about that, Joshua can do it without Holma. Valter is bulky and hits like a truck, but Vanessa or Cormag with a dragon spear can make quick work of him. I like that these bosses have good answers to them and are challenging but not unbeatable if you didn't prepare those answers. It's a cool map, I'm putting it at the top of fun tier, I would have made it kill bosses and not route, but it's still fun. The next map is chapter 16, and this is the last one that is different depending on whether you did Erika or Ephraim route, but it doesn't change that much. The main differences are the starting position is a little different, and in Erika's route, the last room is scarier because it has a bolting sage instead of the eclipse druids. This is a pretty cool map. It's one of the few late game maps that isn't an easy warp skip, and I give it some credit for that. The boss is difficult to reliably one round, and it's hard to get a warper into a great position for warping anyway without triggering a bunch of reinforcements. It can be done, it just takes some planning. Most people will probably play this map the normal way. The map starts off pretty simple as you fight your way to the throne room, but as you near it, things suddenly become a lot more hectic. There's lots of reinforcements, and it's easy to accidentally trigger more while you're fighting, so you can end up in a situation where you're fighting enemies on three different sides, which requires a lot of competent combat units to manage. Alternatively, on repeat playthroughs, once you know the reinforcement triggers a bit better, you can make sure you're prepared for them and take it a bit slower, though you will likely lose some of the map's treasure to thieves if you do so. Fortunately, none of the treasures are terribly important, so this doesn't feel too bad. If you really want everything, getting all the treasure is pretty challenging on this map, but not too punishing if you can't because none of it is that important. It's all just nice-to-haves versus need-to-haves. This map can be a little frustrating if you don't know how the reinforcements work, and because the siege tomes can be tricky to deal with in the Erika version of the map. But I think it's a fun puzzle to figure out, and because of that, it goes in the fun tier. Next up is River of Regrets, where we get our final recruitable unit, Cyrene, who can either be recruited by Tana, Inez, or Vanessa. Alternatively, she will join automatically as long as she survives the map. This map centers around a platform of land in the middle with three green villagers on it. The enemies all converge on the center and will attack the villagers. If you save them all, you're rewarded with a rescue staff, which is pretty good, though you may not find a situation to use every charge of it since we're near the end of the game and you already have warp. Still, saving the villagers is pretty tough if you aren't warp skipping the map. Enemies are on them as early as turn two, so you need to move fast to rescue them. There are also some exciting droppables and stealables on the map, including a Brave Axe on the bottom right and a stealable Draco shield on the Berserker at the top of the map. I think these act as decent incentives not to immediately warp the map. Another good incentive for that is that the boss, Leon, has hands. 
He's tricky to one round, and he can one-shot low resistance units that don't have a ton of health. He also repeatedly spawns druids in front of him that can make it tricky to get a unit in range to fight him. Still, this is a map that pushes you to go fast because it's easy to become overwhelmed if you don't. Dealing with Leon is one thing, but dealing with Leon while a bunch of pre-promotes are attacking you from three different sides while trying to protect green units? That's tough. Not impossible, but tough. Usually, my approach to this map is to send a flyer with the Dragon Spear to kill the flyers to the northwest, while my best boss killers rush to Leon before the non-flying enemies have a chance to attack the villagers. But regardless of which approach you take, this is a fast-paced, exciting map, and I really enjoy playing it. Goes into the very fun tier for me. We're really approaching the end of the game now as we hit Chapter 18, Two Faces of Evil, which is often lovingly referred to as Egg Map. This map is loaded with these harmless little eggs that slowly gain HP. When their HP is full, they hatch into a monster that you have to deal with. So it's in your best interest to kill as many eggs as you can before they hatch, especially because killing an egg gives a unit a ton of experience. This map is the most puzzle-like of the map so far, as it mostly revolves around figuring out what combination of units to use to fastest destroy the eggs, while still being able to deal with the few enemies that are on the map. It's a great map for a lot of often disrespected units to shine. Cyrene is great here, Null is great here for summoner's mobility. Basically, anyone with bad to mediocre combat, but flight or good movement is great here. I really enjoy the change of pace from the rest of the maps. My only real complaint with this map is that it makes heavy use of proximity-based reinforcements. For example, if you send someone to go deal with the eggs to the southeast, a bunch of additional enemies spawn once they get there. It's not a big deal on subsequent playthroughs when you can plan around this, but on your first playthrough, it can feel like a bit of a gotcha, especially if you carefully planned out your route to destroy all the eggs, only to be foiled by reinforcements that you could not have known about. Still, I like the variety that this map brings to the table, enough so that I'm sliding it into the very fun tier. It's a map I look forward to on every playthrough. Now we start to enter Warp City with Chapter 19, for these big warp skip maps, I will be evaluating them both with and without warp. I know some people don't like to hold it against a map when it can be warp skipped, but I disagree. Warp isn't an exploit, it's a tool the game gives you, I think it's fair to assume that we use it, especially when there are things you can do to disincentivize warp skips or at least make them more difficult, which some of the previous maps have done. Chapter 19, Last Hope, is a Fog of War defense map, though it can be ended early by killing the boss. The boss doesn't spawn that far from your troops, so if you want it to be, this is an easy warp skip, and honestly, this is how I usually play this map. This is partially because playing the map any other way is pretty boring. At first glance, it looks like you need to defend the throne room, which can be entered from five different tiles, and that seems pretty daunting. But it's important to note that the objective isn't protect the throne, it's protect the green unit on the throne. This means we have the option to pick him up and move him somewhere else. Either treasure room on the left or right is super defensible and allows the map to quickly become an end turn simulator where there's no real risk of failure once you've set up your defenses, but you still have to play through 13 turns of the map. To the map's credit, I do think it's more fun when you don't realize you can move the green unit to a safer place, but even then it's very much a set up your defenses and press end turn map, and 13 turns is just too long for that to me. This map does feature some treasure, but the problem is we're already at the end of the game, so your army is likely endgame ready by now. The most notable item here is the Speedwing, which you're likely to miss if you warp skip, but is otherwise pretty easy to grab. Overall, this map is just very easy to trivialize, and not that fun to play if you choose not to trivialize it. For that reason, it goes into the not fun tier. Just before the game's finale, we have Darkling Woods, Chapter 20. And this map is absolutely painful, if you don't skip it. There are dozens of enemies, and either way you go, north or south, it's not particularly strategically interesting, it's just mobs of enemies for you to fight, and mobs of reinforcements behind them. I will give the map a bit of credit, the warp skip is kinda of fun for this map. Since you need to seize, it requires a double warp, and you have to fight through the beginning of the map or do some fun rescue dropping over the mountain if you want to do your warps, because your warper needs to be closer to the boss than he is at the beginning. So it's a little more interesting than some other warp skips. It's still a quick skip though, so it's not like it's that fun. Another thing I like about this map is that it's set up in such a way that if you missed warp in the desert chapter or used it all already, you can still skip most of the enemies by flyer dropping a unit near the boss so you will almost always have a way to avoid fighting the enemies. 
Basically, you get to choose between a kind of interesting skip for this map or an hour-long slog. Either way, I can't say I look forward to replaying this map when I play Sacred Stones. It goes in the not fun tier for me. Fortunately, the game ends on a high note with a chapter that I do like. The finale of Sacred Stones is a straight shot to Leon either down the left or right side of the map, with sort of mini-bosses in the form of a Draco zombie on either side. But the real challenge is when you get to Leon himself. He's surrounded by Gorgons, and he has tons of skeleton reinforcements that spawn behind him. So the last push to defeat him is pretty exciting, especially since he really packs a punch. Even with a pure water, you will likely have some units that can't take a hit from him. To me, this makes him feel like a pretty climactic final boss. Notably, this map can be skipped, but it takes some doing. Most units can't reliably kill Leon on their own, but one that can is Murr with just a little help. So if you get Saleh's magic to 20, often by using energy rings, he can actually warp her near Leon. You'll have to warp in another unit to kill a skeleton in her way, but then she can go attack Leon, and if you use a Latona to heal her, she can kill him on enemy phase. I think this is a super cool skip, and it takes a lot of planning to pull off, to the point where I actually find it enjoyable to do. There are other ways to skip this map as well, this is just one of the more reliable ones. So, if you have the resources, there's a cool warp here, but I also think that the map is pretty exciting and climactic, even if you play it without warp. It's not super interesting though, and I think it's funny that they included a chest with a promotion item in it on the final map of the game. But with all of that in mind, this map goes into the fun tier. After killing Leon, we have one more quick map against Fomortis, the Demon King himself. This is more of a victory lap than a real chapter. On turn 1, you can just have all of your units attack the Demon King because he will not fight back on the first enemy phase. Instead, he summons a bunch of generics. So it's a very easy two turn. You attack with everyone on turn 1, use Latona, and then attack with everything on turn 2. Easy peasy. I would prefer if he did attack on turn 2 so there would at least be a little more risk of someone dying, but I think as an end of game victory lap, this map is fine. I always have fun killing the Demon King. Still, it is just a quick two turn so it's hard to rate it too highly. I'm gonna just put it in fine. Alright, now let's quickly talk about Ephraim Route. I'm going to be brief on these maps because I don't play this route a ton and thus have less to say about them. Chapter 9 Ephraim is Fort Rigwald, and this one is just okay to me. It suffers from winding hallway syndrome, though I do enjoy having to figure out how to recruit Amelia without Franz or Ephraim getting wrecked by the archers and enemies in the hallway that she's in, and I enjoy grabbing the treasure up top while the reinforcements spawn up there. I like that there are some things for units to do that aren't Seth. Still, it is a winding hallway, best I can do is find tier. In contrast, Chapter 10 of Ephraim Route is a banger. This is a defend Dusel or kill boss map with a couple cool side objectives. The main objective, protecting Dusel, is actually really easy because Dusel is a monster and at very low risk of death. However, you still want to rush down there to help him because defending the cavaliers he comes with earns you a knight crest at the end of the map, and they are not as durable as he is. The other recruitment on this map is Cormag, who can be most easily recruited with Tana, though you need to be a little careful with her as there are a couple ballistas in the water that can shoot her down if you don't watch where you're placing her. You can use Dusel to recruit Cormag too if you don't want to risk Tana, but if you're doing that you need to hurry up and recruit Dusel because he needs to get into position to recruit Cormag and it's a little harder since he can't fly. Once you grab the side objectives the map is pretty easy. You can either just defend and survive or push forward and kill the boss, but I really like the fast pace you're encouraged to take at the beginning to rescue and recruit everyone, and then I like that you have the option to fight the boss if you choose, or not if you don't. This is the one Ephraim route that I'm sad I don't get to play when I go Erica route, it goes right into peak for me. After chapter 10 is perhaps the most infamous map in Sacred Stones, Phantom Ship. Phantom Ship is a Fog of War route map that takes place on boats. The issue with this map to me is largely the gargoyles. Gargoyles are the most dangerous foes on the map, and they often spawn in Fog of War where you can't see them. Even using torches, it's pretty easy to get jump scared on this map by a gargoyle, and often that will result in a reset. Once you know where everything spawns, the map's not so bad, but if you don't, it's pretty painful, to the point where many people deploy only Ephraim, Dusel, and Seth just so that they don't have to worry about a squishy unit dying to a surprise gargoyle. And the thing is, even when you do know the spawns, I wouldn't say this map becomes fun, just less annoying. So it goes into the not fun tier for me, below the late game warps, because at least I can warp those and be done with them. After Phantom Ship, our boats land in Tizel for Chapter 12. And I think this is a fine, if very forgettable map. 
I like that there are a couple lanes you could send your units down at the beginning of the map and things to do on both sides of it. I like that to recruit Marissa here, you have to talk to her with Ewan. It reminds me of the Joshua recruitment where you need to clear out all of the danger so that you can walk your wimpy baby over to go recruit the Myrmidon. I also like it when FE games do the thing where the boss leaves and a new boss shows up. It's a great way to give important enemies some screen time without having us actually fight them half a dozen times. And Kalak does this here and it's neat. Totally fine map, goes in the fine tier. Next up is a more memorable map, Floor Spar's Oath, and I really like this one. It's a route map with enemies all over and villages to grab that encourage you to get moving. And something I like about it is that it spawns Garrick and Tethys off to the right, away from the main force of your army. This encourages you to split your army and send Garrick some support, or at least send someone to pass Garrick some better weapons. From there, I usually end up splitting my army three ways. Garrick and his friends go down and get the village on the right, a few secondary combat units go grab the village on the left, and my best units go take down the boss and the glut of units around her. As you may have realized by now, I like it when maps encourage me to split up and use multiple units instead of just sweeping with my strongest combat unit. Easy fun tier map for me, I like this one. And to end the video, we have Ephraim's last map before the armies rejoin. Chapter 14 is pretty cool, but very punishing if you're unprepared. Let's start with what I like about it. I like that our recruitable character, Renak, starts pretty far away from you and is quickly on the move. You have to get going if you want to catch him, but that puts you at risk of eating a Berserk Staff or dying to the glut of enemies around the map. I like that the map encourages you to get going to get the treasure, that's fun. And if you prefer to play slow, you don't miss out on too much here, mainly an Angelic Robe and a Member Card. And you won't miss the Member Card too much in Sacred Stones. This map is brutal if you're unprepared though. The Berserk Staffs are pretty easy to deal with if you have some restores on you, and really difficult to deal with if you don't. And with the way Sacred Stones works, you can't leave and go buy Restore Staffs after you see the Berserks, so it can be a rough go on the first playthrough. The lesson here is, always pack a Restore Staff, and if you do this, the map is fun. So into the fun tier it goes. So here's the whole list. What do you think? Do you have any maps that you like that I didn't, or the other way around? Let me know in the comments, and if you liked the video, consider hitting the like or subscribe button so that you never miss an upload. Or join the Discord that you'll find linked in the description where I post and discuss the videos and Fire Emblem in general. Either way, thanks for sticking around to the end, and have yourself a lovely week.